how do you become a good bridge? Is your bridge solid? Is it in integrity? Is it ready to hold the work and the healing and the culture that you're connected to? So building a good bridge for us is a regenerative practice, not an extractive practice. Being a bridge is being in service to medicine, being in service to a specific lineage, perhaps creating a bridge both energetically and physically. I think the very first thing is to be a good student, is to be open to the learnings of the Indigenous teachings that you're wanting to support. Welcome to the Modern Psychedelics Podcast. Thank you so much for being here and choosing to spend some time with me today. I'm your host, Lana. This is the place where we explore how modern humans can work with psychedelics and plant medicine to engage more deeply with life. You can expect balanced and grounded conversations around therapeutic, spiritual, and recreational containers. All right, let's journey. Okay, I don't know about you, but I cannot stop hearing about kana. It's a succulent plant medicine from South Africa. Kana has been traditionally used by the indigenous Khoisan people for mood enhancement, stress relief, and spiritual practices. Kana is an empathogen, so it helps us to emphasize feelings of connectedness, open-heartedness, and calm. Some call it nature's MDMA, and some consider it a psychedelic, though pharmacologically it's not a classic psychedelic. But the best part of Kana is that it's completely legal in North America and sold as a safe health product. I'm actually on a Kana microdose today as I record this, and I'm exploring it as a supportive tool to shift my energy from high high summer energy to more relaxed, productive fall energy. So this protocol is all about slowing down and rebuilding supportive habits and connection to myself so that I can have more intentional days. Kana can be consumed via chewing, smoking, or making tea, but for the modern person, an extract is an easy and reliable choice because extracts are the most potent, reliable, and convenient option. Kana Extract Co. is leading the way in creating quality, potent extracts. Their cutting-edge extraction process ensures absolute purity and the precise alkaloid profiles. For you, this means unparalleled potency and the amazing felt effects. Kana Extract Co. also ethically sources their products, which is so important to me, working with growers who uphold benefit sharing agreements with traditional knowledge keepers. Their benefit sharing agreements showcase a dedication not just to product quality, but also to preserving and supporting the cohesion culture. I love that Kana Extract Co. is transparent about quality. They provide third-party lab testing and credentials like FDA inspection and GMP certification. You can easily access these reports on their website. So join me and start your Kana journey today. Visit KanaExtract.com and you can use Lana at checkout to save 10%. That's KanaExtract.com, K-A-N-N-A Extract.com and use Lana, L-A-N-A at checkout to save 10% off your first order. You guys are going to love this medicine. Okay, back to the episode. Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to the show. If you're new here, welcome. I'm so, so, so happy that you have discovered this podcast in a sea of information about psychedelics. I'm just happy that you are here consuming this episode. And today's episode is, who it is an important one. Let me tell you, it's an important one. But before we get into today's guests and episode, I just wanted to give you guys a little update. Well, first of all, happy fall. I'm really excited that it's fall. It's September 13th as I'm recording this, and I'm actually getting ready to go to one last music festival of the season. You guys know I've been all about my recreational containers this summer, and it's a really special one. I haven't been to Harvest in four years. It's kind of my spiritual home. It's where I first actually discovered psychedelics and had my first experience with LSD, and it's very, very special to me. So I'm so excited to go there this weekend. And then after that, yeah, it, the summer's been so crazy. I'm really going to slow things down, devote more of my energy towards work projects, get back to some healthy habits that have fallen away. And you know what? It's all good that the healthy habits have fallen away because guess what? They've fallen away before and I can bring them back again. And I'm not stressed about it. I feel like this is like a post boga attitude that I have towards life. Like, you know, I'm not perfect and no medicine or experience is going to make me perfect because perfection doesn't exist. But I know that I'm in the driver's seat of my life and that it's okay to go through periods of 
things falling away. And I know that I can always get back to it. So it's all good. But I am currently microdosing Kana. So you guys would have heard uh, Kana Extract Co. as the sponsor of the show. Thank you, Kana Extract Co. Love you guys. Um, but I'm using their Kana to support this transition and I'm microdosing it. It's a psychedelic adjacent product um, that's legal in the US. But if you're in a similar boat, if you're going through any kind of transition, which honestly, like September and the fall are like such a new year feeling for me personally. And I know that a lot of people relate to September being that kind of start of the year where there is a lot of transition. So if you are in a similar boat, if you're going through any kind of transition or fresh start, just know that microdosing is a practice that can really help you. And I always talk about this when I talk about microdosing that I personally use it to smooth transition periods, to build those healthy habits, to just bring back intentionality. And just that aspect of microdosing alone is just as powerful as the medicine. So with that, I'm so excited to announce that Flow Formula is open for registration again. So if you aren't aware, Flow Formula is my eight-week microdosing program, but it's so much more than a microdosing program um, that I am running with my dear friend and business partner, Jenny from Wakeful Travel. And this is our second cohort. We learned so much in the first one and it was already amazing, but we've improved it because we took feedback from our first cohort and we've applied it. So Flow Formula, like I said, it's more than a microdosing program. It's a, the structure is eight uh, classes. Actually, it's nine. You get a bonus class, uh, weekly classes for 90 to 120 minutes. And along with that, we have support and accountability through Discord with uh, support from me and Jenny. We have homework. We have accountability groups. We have some amazing guest teachers. Um, Adam from Othership is teaching a nervous system module. And Laura Dawn will be back. Marisa is teaching on the power of your story. I am teaching three entire modules on energy and life coaching. And that's really about addressing the mental and the belief system side of things. Jenny's teaching on microdosing fundamentals. And she's also teaching on nutrition because she's a certified holistic nutritionist. And we, we're also hooking people up who sign up with a trusted list of microdose providers, which people really like. So like I said, not just a microdosing course. It's about using the container of microdosing to create the conditions for flow in your life. It's about flow state and flow with life. And it's really meant to equip you with tools and skills and energy shifts and perspective shifts to find flow in everything that you do to f to create your life from the energy of flow. So you can read the testimonials from our previous cohort on our website, which is linked in the show notes. So early bird is on until September 27th. So if you sign up before then, you can save 300 bucks, which is awesome. That's like 100 bucks a month off the monthly plan. We have a painful and we have a monthly plan as well. So, so, so excited. Can't wait to see the amazing uh, group that comes together for this. So check the link in the show notes if you want to learn more. If you want to get on a call with me or Jenny, book a little discovery call, casual chat with us. I'll also leave a link for that in the show notes. And yeah, I hope to see you guys there. You can also reach out to me through Instagram and I will get back to you. Okay, let's get to today's guests. I love these two humans that I had the chance to meet when I visited Costa Rica last spring. So they are the senior program directors at Reunion, a not-for-profit center in Costa Rica. So this is going to be an interview with Karina and Julian. So Reunion is a center that provides ayahuasca and psilocybin experiences. I visited to do an ayahuasca retreat with them. So you can hear more about that in episodes 60 and 64. It was so powerful and I'm still integrating a lot of the stuff that came up for me. It's been absolutely life-changing. And I... I just fell so in love with Reunion and their team. And that's because the medicine is truly guiding the way that they operate Reunion. There is such a deep reverence and respect for the cultures and the plant teachers. There's so much humility and grace within their team. And you're really going to hear that in the in this episode with Karina and Julian. And at the heart of their not-for-profit model, uh, first of all, having a not-for-profit model is extremely rare in the retreat business. But at the heart of it is this idea of reciprocity and regeneration. And it's not just about giving money 
It's about a way of living and operating in a constant give and take, just like we see in nature. So we talk a lot about that. And it's really all about the way of nature, living in alignment with nature in every way. So there is a note at the end where Julian says that they're not speaking on behalf of any lineages, rather from their experiences as longtime students and cultural bridges. So that's really important. Obviously, no one is here to speak on behalf of any cultures that they are not part of. But this is a great interview for people who see facilitation or space holding in their future, or even current facilitators um, who want to walk in relationship with medicine in a deep way. And, you know, people like me who are participants of plant medicine retreats and ceremonies who want to do it with so much respect for the cultures that they come from. So we talk about building relationships with different wisdom keepers and teachers and the path of studentship, what it means and looks like to put people over profit and the planet over profit. What is a cultural bridge and how to be one? The path of studentship with direct indigenous wisdom keepers. Plant medicine as a relationship, not a tool. This was probably my favorite part of the conversation. Uh, we talk about land stewardship, which Reunion does so beautifully, and creating narrative neutral spaces for exploring spirituality. I know you guys are going to just absolutely love this episode. And don't forget to check out the show notes for all that information on Flow Formula. All right, guys, catch you on the other side. So excited to be here with Karina and Julian, beautiful facilitators who, yeah, saw me through my journey with the Shipibo Ayahuasca Medicine in Costa Rica just a couple months ago. So what's really cool is that I was there about two months ago and my journey was all about gut healing and learning to dress my gut. And you guys, I actually just started like a gut healing protocol with a holistic nutritionist this week, and we're connecting this week. Cool. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having us, Lana. Excited to be here with you. Yes, thank you. It's good to be here with you. Good to see you again. And happy to hear that you're addressing the microbiome, the gut. Yeah. 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 And just like the energetics associated with like actually trusting my gut. So yeah, that definitely began at reunion for me. And yeah. Okay. So let's start with Karina. Do you want to give just an introduction of who you are and how you got involved in the work of facilitating plant medicine experiences for people? Thank you so much. So I'm the senior program director here at Reunion. I've been on my healing journey and working with plant medicine for over nine years. I've also been living in Costa Rica for about nine years. And shortly after my first experience, I decided to switch careers, to change and to step into the world of healing and understanding and bridging different cultures and really just connecting with the plants and creating a relationship, a strong relationship. And so that relationship has built over many years, working with many different lineages and different medicines. And I'm really excited to be part of the reunion team and just bringing all of the relationships that I've been working to cultivate with the plants and with the wisdom keepers here in this new design and this new way of sharing. Yeah, it's been beautiful to see where your journey has brought you. Julian, what about you? Can you tell us a little bit about your personal journey? Yeah, for for me, working with these natural medicines started in my youth when I was about 15. And the space holding started then in college and just after college, although it was in, in no official capacity, there was no set or setting. It was not in a ceremonial context. And I started working with ayahuasca almost 15 years ago and then probably about nine or 10 stepped into the facilitation role. And it was really to deepen my own practice. It was really to study and to be in ceremony. Went and worked in the Sacred Valley for many years at a center there and learned a lot by doing and a lot by watching. So a lot of the ayahuasca grunt work, the helping people to the bathroom, carrying <laughs> purge buckets and yeah, the kind of less glamorous things. So yeah, and then it's grown ever since. Yeah, Less glamorous, but like a really important job. Can you guys, either one, whoever wants to take this, Tell us a little bit about reunion, 
such a special slice of heaven. I wish I was there right now. Can you guys tell us about Reunion and the work you're doing there? Yes, it's such a beautiful place to be able to live, to call home and to help steward. So our founder, Brad Wells, decided that he wanted to start a not-for-profit medicine healing center. And he chose Costa Rica and he chose this very beautiful cove in Guanacaste, which was originally stewarded by the Choratega people of Costa Rica. And so we often thank them and acknowledge them for the opportunity to be on this land, to be doing the work that we're doing here. And so with Reunion, as I mentioned, being a not-for-profit, reciprocity is really at the core of our mission. And so anything outside of operational costs, any revenue that comes in outside of operational costs then goes to three different funds that we're currently operating. One is a scholarship fund because we strongly believe that people should have access to the work, especially if they're in financial need. The second is a wisdom keepers fund where we actually give back to the indigenous wisdom keepers that we work with and some that we're creating relationships with. So really important for us to give back to the original stewards of the medicine and to keep that bridge strong. And then lastly, it's replenish the idea that we'd like to regenerate generate medicinal forest. So planting medicine for future generations. And so here at Reunion, we're working with ayahuasca and we're also working with psilocybin. And through the ayahuasca pathway, we're working with different indigenous lineages and yeah, learning a lot, learning a lot. We have a beautiful temple here where we welcome folks to come and heal and creating different programs for different folks to come and connect with the medicine. It is a beautiful temple. I miss that place. It's just has the most loving energy in it. So beautifully built. I'm going to put a pin on the not-for-profit part because that is really important. We're going to circle back to that. Can you share a little bit about the programs that you're offering at Reunion? Yeah. So the when it comes to the programs, we have our psilocybin program, which we call Inner Alchemy. And that we offer three ceremonies in that experience. And then we offer ayahuasca and the ayahuasca comes in different forms. It depends on the wisdom keepers that we are working with at that time. So we work with Hunikun, Shipibo and Kispikanchi and each ceremony is completely different in many ways. The the thing that's the same is the medicine, but even that is different. The brew as the vines are different, as the leaves are different. And to even take a step further back, there are several guiding principles that have shaped our week. And the first being embodiment. And this is the idea around the physicality. So we offer movement classes, breathwork experiences, specific diet to to help support the physical organism. The body is such an important part of anyone's spiritual process. It's, It's the most practical in many ways as you're experiencing the microbiome shifting and how we can relate to our body as that temple, that notion temple. A quick aside, thinking about the healing of the gut, many traditions in the East used to believe that millions and millions of deities lived in the belly. And they were off by a couple of billion, but just the idea that we see the body as the storehouse or as a temple, as part of the animistic world that we're in. So embodiment is such a crucial part. And then ancient wisdom, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but that's centered around the medicine and then also different practices that these wisdom keepers have brought to us, flower baths, different perfume practices, different crystal healing studies. Also what we call the medicine of the word, the sharing in community and healing community in, it, in itself in some ways is an ancient practice. And then the third part is integration. And we see this as really a key part of the work. This is, the, this is when the rubber meets the road. This is the chop wood, carry water. This is the, okay, time to shift the diet, time to check out that exercise routine, time to have those tough conversations, time to start meditating, et cetera, et cetera. So we offer in an integration program. So that sits behind medicine work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for people listening, just to be very clear, there's two programs at Reunion. One is Inner Alchemy, the psilocybin program, and one is Wisdom Keepers, the ayahuasca program. People aren't doing ayahuasca and psilocybin within the same week, (laughs) separate containers. If I'm not mistaken, the Inner Alchemy psilocybin program is led by your incredible facilitation team who I love so much. (laughs) Yes. The psilocybin weeks are led, are led by our team here. The psilocybin program is with you guys. 
and then the ayahuasca wisdom keepers. Would you like to just speak a little bit about the, you mentioned the three lineages that you're working with. And I just want to know that, so I took part in the Shipibo, the Lopez Sanchez lineage, correct? It felt so intensely special. Like I was brought to tears every night in ceremony, sharing of a culture in a way that felt like so authentic and real and in so much love and respect. So I just want to take a moment. Would you like to just name and acknowledge these wisdom keepers that you have? Like you're not just bringing in wisdom keepers, like you seem to have relationships with them, like deeply rooted, beautiful relationships with them. So yeah, can you speak into that a little bit? Yes, of course. It's an honor to to bring and to share this space with the wisdom keepers. And these are all people that Julian and I have learned from. These are all of our teachers. So before coming to reunion, we worked very closely with them. And as Julian mentioned, the Huniquin, Nina Wapatemata, beautiful teacher, the Lopez Sanchez family, Maestra Inez, Lila and Laura, the Shipibo Canibo people, which which is the journey that you were with us on. And then Titu Amaru Salka, which is our wisdom keeper from the Kispikanchi nation of Peru. And this is really all about relating. It's really all about how do we create a sacred and safe space for them to land? How do we open ourselves to receive their culture and then also allow for the place to be energetically safe and clean for them to hold their prayers and to hold their medicine. Because when we're bridging medicine and we're bridging people as wisdom keepers, we're also bridging their lineage. We're also bridging their prayers and their communities. And so we're actually bridging lineage to land here in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica has been such an incredible place to work. The land here has welcomed us and it's part of our weekly ritual to acknowledge the land that we're on and to acknowledge the guardians that are here and all of it plays that we're right on the ocean and all of the elements that are part of this daily exchange of wisdom and information it's all part of the relationship that we're creating with the wisdom keepers. So it's been years of study, whether here or in Peru, both Julian and I with the different wisdom keepers, and also making sure that they're feeling comfortable and that they're feeling safe. And one of the big reasons why they're happy to work with us here is because of the not-for-profit status. So basically this idea of being in right relationship or being in reciprocity. Right now, there's a lot of commodification of plant medicine happening. And we're just, as Reunion, as Team Reunion, we're just in a deep inquiry around how to hold this medicine in a good way. And so when Julian and I were tasked with help us to create the Reunion experience with the wisdom keepers and ayahuasca and inner alchemy and psilocybin, we were also tasked with understanding how to weave together the design, how to bring everything together in a really good way. And we remembered our teachings and our teachings from our wisdom keeper, indigenous teachers really go back to reciprocity or in Quechua, it's called Aini, the art of giving and receiving. And so this idea that we are a not-for-profit and that we're able to take the money that's coming through after operating costs and putting that right back into the flow of giving right back into the opportunity to have someone come in and experience the medicine and work with the medicine that might not have had that opportunity. And we're also, we're giving back to the wisdom keepers. So should they have a need in their village, they face cultural problems that we know nothing about. And I think the first step is having that awareness that we really do not know. We need to trust in them. And so this idea that we're just giving them this support financially and allowing them to, of course, make their own decisions and do what they need to do with those funds also feels in right relationship because they are the ones that are bringing the teachings. They are the ones that have sacrificed. They are the ones that are taking the risk to come and share their medicine and we are receiving. So how can we give back to them? By giving back to them, the original stewards of the medicine, we're giving back to the medicine. We're giving back to the transmission. We believe, all of us here at Reunion, we believe that creates a very specific frequency, a very specific energy to come and have medicine within that understanding that we're healing ourselves, but we're also helping heal the collective while we're here together. Thank you so much for sharing that. Just hearing you speak about 
the dynamic of how Reunion is operating and in relationship with the wisdom keepers that you're working with just reminds me of like the laws of nature and how nature operates and that natural given take that occurs that allows nature to thrive. I personally think that's the way that these medicine spaces should operate, not within a industry or a capitalist system. I feel like this is the way. So kudos to you guys for doing it. Can you tell us a little bit about like when Reunion was starting, what actually inspired the not-for-profit model? Because that is very rare. I don't think I've seen many of any not-for-profit medicine centers. Yeah, of course. Our founder, Brad Wells, had a very deep experience with ayahuasca where it came to light for him that he was meant to start a not-for-profit center. And at the same time, Julian and I were working on our own in a different area of Costa Rica, working on starting a not-for-profit focused on bridging the wisdom keepers so that they could hold their ceremonies. And we met by chance, Julian and Brad met, and the rest is history. We basically joined forces and we realized the incredible gift of the land here at Sugar Beach and realized the incredible gifts that we have within these relationships with the wisdom keepers. And it all just worked out perfectly. And why is not for profit so important to you? Like, why why make that decision? What does that change for you? Yeah, it's something that, you know, what we've seen is a commodification of the medicine and the healers, which takes us into this interesting space. This kind of, it's very challenging for us to be in, the, in, in this space. It's one of objectification and it's extractive. So by moving into a not-for-profit space, we move closer to some of the teachings that we've received, highlighting the one on reciprocity. But also what we've seen through our teachers is many of these teachers will come, they'll earn, they'll go back to their village and they will offer the money that they make to their community. So we see this as a new old model. Perhaps nothing has changed. And for us, it's it could be revolutionary in some ways. So it's really important for us because it allows us to be walking in integrity in ourselves through our own practice, what we've learned and how we implement that. So by bringing these practices, we become closer to ourself, our source. And in many ways, my sense is that the medicine activates it in a different way, perhaps on another level. And this can allow for deeper degrees of healing or other ways of healing that can allow us to untangle our relationship around perhaps money or late stage capitalism or what it means to be in yeah. working toward solidarity, ethics and economies. Yeah, I imagine that when you're operating as a not for profit makes decision making a very different process. We're all sitting in a meeting talking about the future of reunion. I'm sure that those decisions that you're going to make are very different. Yeah, really different. And it all comes back for me to that question of how do you become a good bridge? Is your bridge solid? Is it in integrity? Is it ready to hold the work and the healing and the culture that you're connected to? So building a good bridge for us is a regenerative practice, not an extractive practice, as Julian mentioned. And for people listening, can you explain what does not-for-profit actually mean? What does it mean for you? What does it mean as a company or a business? Well, what it means for a union is that anything outside of operational costs, any revenue that's coming in from the signups, from people attending, yeah. goes into the three funds that I had mentioned earlier. So basically, none of it is taken as profit by Brad or by the founding team here. It all goes back into one of the three funds. And for me personally, as I mentioned, it's really about living in right relationship. It's about doing the right thing. It's about being in service. And for me, that is really the only way that I could sit behind an altar in regards to psilocybin, because Julian and I are serving that medicine. And secondly, even supporting the wisdom keepers. It's really the only way I can step forward within this work of medicine is to be in right relationship and in reciprocity. Wow. Those are really powerful words, like connecting the way that you're operating to what feels an integrity for me to sit behind, getting emotional, <laughs> what feels an integrity for me to sit behind an altar and serve medicine? Really powerful. What about you, Julian? What does that mean for you? Uh, yeah, Karina says it so wonderfully, but I think, I, I think one thing to add to it is to really put people over profit and to put planet over profit. 
And this is the mentality of getting back into this regenerative approach. Because when we start to look toward bottom line as the major driver or the major decision making, then things start to fall away. Perhaps these other regenerative practices, eco practices, taking care of our people, not moving into predatory or sales approaches to the people that are on the grounds, to the guests that are on the grounds, but really coming from that place of of heart centeredness and connection and saying, we are here to be of service and we are here to work with you. We are not seeing you as a number or as a potential dollar sign down the line. It's really about the work. So that's a big blessing for us that we are here for the work itself. That's really, that stress is taken away. And just to, just to touch in, we're learning. This is an experiment. Stuff is coming up for us around our relationships to our finances and to our money and to what it means to be in abundance and safety. So it's there, there are things that come up in this process. So it's a beautiful opportunity and it's wonderful to talk about it. So hopefully we'll, hopefully this is making some sense to you and to, to everyone mm-hmm. listening. No, I love that. Thanks for that transparency about just like where you're at with your process of trying to understand how to do this thing. Like we're all learning at the end of the day. I did really appreciate like when I was at reunion that it didn't feel predatory. I have been in ceremonial spaces where there was, it felt like upselling or like book this session or buy this product that is like part of my MLM, (laughs) like side business. And it just felt icky. And I have to say, like, I didn't feel that at reunion. There was like a beautiful little gift shop that you could peruse on your own. It was not at all this spend money feeling that I've had in other spaces. And I have to say, like, when I was at Iboga Wellness Center, it was also like very non-predatory. So I really appreciate that because when people are in medicine, that's the last thing that you should be doing is upselling them and trying to get them to open up their wallets. So I really appreciate that. Karina, you put out a really good question that I want to explore deeper, talking about what does it mean to be a good cultural bridge? Can you explain to people, first of all, what is that term, a cultural bridge? What does it mean to be a cultural bridge in this space? Yeah. So first I'll say that I'm definitely still learning. I think the very first thing is to be a good student, is to be open to the learnings of the Indigenous teachings that you're wanting to support. Being a bridge is being in service to medicine, being in service to a specific lineage, perhaps creating a bridge both energetically and physically for a wisdom keeper to leave their village or to leave their land where they're from, to come to a different place, which could be very strange and overwhelming for them, and to share their wisdom. So to share their medicine and their different healing modalities and to share a direct transmission of healing. And it's the, this is the reason why we work with Indigenous wisdom keepers. It's I think it's beautiful that other people are learning and picking up practices as long as it's done in a really good and integrous way, that's wonderful. But I think what I don't wanna forget is the direct transmission that comes from the Indigenous peoples that have been holding the medicines originally since the beginning of time, since the beginning of our knowledge of the medicine. So it's this relationship building that happens, that takes a good bit of time and also takes a lot of dedication and a lot of work and a lot of understanding and a lot of trial and error, a lot of making mistakes and asking for forgiveness and really owning your own shit in order for you to learn and grow and be in integrity to the point where you can welcome and receive someone's medicine and someone's prayer. As I mentioned, it's very important to acknowledge what some of these Indigenous nations have been through once they've opened up their doors to sharing. So it's sometimes likely they may not be so excited to share the medicine or to share their ways or their practices or their ceremonies to Westerners. But Julian and I have been working for many years to establish strong relationships in support of their work because we strongly believe that the world needs the healing and they also believe the world needs the healing. So in this very reciprocal relationship, they're coming to us also for support in ways of helping helping them to get the right exposure, not just any exposure, helping them to land in a good place where they can share their ceremonies, where they can share their medicines and where they can connect 
to more people that are looking to understand the culture, to keep it alive. They share their artisanias, their artisanal crafts. They bring many different things that are not just medicine, many different understandings. And it's like a school. So it's to be in school with indigenous people is to understand, you know, what it is to learn from people that when they stewarded the earth, you could drink from any stream, you could plant food in any soil and it would flourish. Something has gone awry since the time when they were stewarding and our time now. And so it's really beautiful, I think, to be able to go back and learn from them so that we can start to make changes now much more towards a regenerative pathway, less towards an extractive pathway, so that our future generations can have a better planet to live on and better relationships to thrive on. Yeah, so what I'm hearing, a lot of being a cultural bridge means being a student. You said something earlier in the interview that I wrote down that I wanted to go back to about creating a sacred and safe space for the wisdom keepers to land. I'm really curious about the personal work, the path of being a student with your teachers, what have you both moved through personally? What have you had to learn? What has that path of being a student been like to get to the point where, you know, these wisdom keepers with so much power and by power, like they have knowledge and wisdom and understanding that not many people in the world do, getting to the point where they are opening their arms to you, opening their heart to you, trusting you to take their hand and to take the hand of someone like myself from the Western world and to bring us together. Like they clearly have a lot of trust for you and it's a reciprocal relationship in that way. What has that path of personal work, personal growth been like for both of you? I know you mentioned like it's been a lot of making mistakes. What else? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a path of studentship for sure. And I can use the relationship that I have with the Maestras Laura, Lila and Inez that you were here with that beautiful family, the Shipibo Canibo family. Sometimes it also takes other bridges, like my dear sister Jessica, who's been their student for many years. And that's how I met that family. And so we're actually co-bridging them. She lives in Peru. She works at their center. It was a moment of recognition when we met that we were on the same path and that we wanted to create a safe space for the maestras to travel to Costa Rica because, as I mentioned, Costa Rica has been a really beautiful place to bridge wisdom keepers to, to bridge medicines to. It's been safe. It's been very clean energetically, and it's just an incredible country. And we met, and there was a lot of exchange before we decided, could we embark on this relationship together? So it's been a constant learning, a constant understanding of relationship building. And also for me, really getting deeper and deeper into my personal relationship and work with the plants by going to their center in Peru, by doing a master plant diet, by opening myself up and really listening. So I think that's the other big thing. It's like being a student, creating safety, but really being able to listen, to understand the needs of another culture as you bridge them, as you create this space, and to navigate all of the challenges that come up when we're trying to speak multiple languages, because that's really what it feels like sometimes it's we're speaking this language of culture with the medicine and then we're turning around and we're speaking more to the western world that is in dire need of healing that is looking for the medicine that would like to work with the medicine and so we're bridging that we're bridging that interaction it's been a lot of listening a lot of learning and a lot of love a lot of connection and a lot of blessed moments with the medicine and i'm sure julian would love to share a little bit more about this as well. (laughs) Yes, please do. And wow, yeah, Jessica, what an absolute angel who has just absolutely devoted her entire life from what I can tell to working with these maestras and sharing their medicine with the world. Like, wow, so inspiring. Julian, what has this personal journey of growth looked like for you to get to a place of being a trusted cultural bridge. Yeah, good, good, really good questions. 
Yeah, thanks. And yeah, I'd like to acknowledge Jessica as well and the relationship with Karina. It's, it, that's, it's one of these old school ways of doing things. It's, do you vouch for this person? It's okay. Your butt's on the line thing. If this doesn't work out, this is going to... So there's that old school exchange where we step into a couple of things. What I've seen is the first thing is respect. And, and that goes for any culture. You show up to any culture with respect and a sense of appreciation and you'll be received. And I think that's what anybody wants is just a little bit of, hey, this is the way we do it here. And this is the way we do it here. And maybe there's some truth to this. I don't know. So I think one of the first things is respect. And something else that's important to to go back to that vouching for somebody else, it's the integrity of one's word. We do what you say and say what you do thing. And, and I yeah. think as we do that, of course, there's going to be stumbles along the way. There's going to be things that are going to be like, hey. And so when we do what we say, we really engender a connection that's heartfelt and trusting. And if we don't, if we make our, if we make mistakes or if things don't land the way they do, it's the sense of taking accountability. And in, in many ways, these are universal, these are universal things. And I think one other, one other key that's really important is to show up with some level of humility. And I think this is a challenge. I know this was a challenge for me in many ways where I would come into a space and be like, why are they doing it that way? One of my other teachers did it this way. And, oh, that's an interesting way of doing that. Or they're singing that like that. And they usually do that at the end in the other ceremonies. And, oh, yeah, that, that's, that, that what it shows to ourself is that we're coming from a place of knowing. It's, oh, do we, we know how to do this. It's our second or third or 10th or 15th time. And we know how to do these things already. So I think having that humility and saying we don't, really know and maybe someone else that has 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years of experience has something to teach us so it's that sit down and shut your mouth sort of thing and when you do open your mouth make sure you follow through with what you say these are general things that i think transcend culture in general so it, it's how do we become a human that's open-hearted and open-minded enough to be able to receive information from other cultures and other peoples without trying to graft on our sort of way of being onto somebody else. Yeah. That like, I think like when entering yeah. these medicine spaces that are so culturally rich, working with direct lineages, it's so important to unlearn in order to actually learn. I don't know if you guys listened to my first sharing of my experience at reunion. I talked about how the medicine was like, you're here, like welcome. But like, first things first, you got to respect this space. And what I learned in that journey was if I'm coming from love, like real, true, unconditional love and openness, like that is respect. What does respect in medicine spaces mean for you guys? Karina, let's start with you. Oh, that's such a good question. And I feel like I need to just go back to listening, just really listening and tuning into what it is that is being shared and taking the time, like, giving it time, giving it space, slowing everything else down to give something its due. Give the process its due, even if it's uncomfortable. Because some, when you slow things down and things get quiet and like you really need to focus on what's going on, sometimes that can get really uncomfortable. If someone is creating a ceremonial container for you, being on time, being humble, listening, and giving it its due, giving it its space, be present. Yeah. Be present for your own healing, be present for what it is that they want to share with you, and try not to create expectations around it. Maybe really working on that, like letting expectations go before you show up so that you can be like really present and giving it like all of your attention. That for me feels like respect. Yeah, I'm, I'm, glad, you, I'm glad you asked her first because that's a really hard question. So it gives me a little bit of time to, <laughs> know, to, to, to think about it. And it's no pressure now. And you really need to conjure up a good one. One of the things the that- The answer's within you. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my not so secret secret. <laughs> the number one tool in my toolkit, the thing that has changed my life for the better, the most, aside from psychedelics, of course, is not therapy, it's not breath work, it's not meditation, it's not even the yoga I've been doing for 15 years. It's coaching. Because coaching is the most actionable tool that I have come across. A few years ago, I fired my therapist and hired a coach, and working with a coach helped me start moving in the direction I wanted to move, and I finally stopped feeling stuck. 
I fell so in love with coaching, even though I wanted to become a therapist at that time, I decided instead to get trained and certified as a professional coach. As a psychedelics informed life coach, I work with people who are on the psychedelic path, which is probably you if you're listening to this podcast. The global coaching client study from the International Coaching Federation shows most clients who work with a professional coach report improved work performance, more growth and opportunities, greater self-confidence, enhanced relationships, more effective communication skills, better work and life balance, and an improvement in wellness. According to the same study, 99% of people who were polled said that they were somewhat or very satisfied with the overall coaching experience. Coaching works. <laughs> I see similar results amongst my clients every week. You can actually read their beautiful in-depth testimonials on my website at modernpsychedelics.net. Along with being psychedelics informed, my style is process oriented. We live in this outcome obsessed world where our default mode is to live life for the destination or the end result. But I have come to understand that the gifts are actually in the journey and that's where we grow and learn and enjoy life the most. So that's why I equip my clients with tools and skills for the long game of life and the long game of medicine work. I'm currently onboarding new one-on-one -on -one clients into my coaching practice. So if this sounds like it would be supportive for where you're at, get in touch with me. I would love to hear from you. And you can click on the link in the show notes or head to modernpsychedelics.net slash coaching. There's lots of info there for you along with those testimonials. I can't wait to connect with you. That's modernpsychedelics.net slash coaching. Okay, let's go back to the episode. One of the one of the things that came to mind, this could be somewhat of an answer, is this idea around patience. And th this is something that that I hear from many different wisdom keepers from different traditions is patience, patience. It's a process. Patience. It's a process. And it's I think this is where the cultures meet, because in uh, perhaps in a culture of immediate gratification, we're used to paying for something and then receiving it right away. So if we've come here and we're paying for this quote unquote healing, sometimes it's, I didn't get all my answers. It's been one ceremony or it's been two ceremonies or it's been, even it's been a whole week and it's, wait a minute, it's, this was, this was five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of stuff that we're bringing in with. And it's like, how come it isn't fixed right away? And how come it doesn't feel good? And how come I didn't see what I wanted to see and all these sensations. So I think when it comes to respect is having patience. And the, one of our one of our colleagues has a really great line, and and he says to the effect of, "The less you know, the deeper you go, and the deeper you go, the less you know." And I just I think that line that line is a way to show respect is just come in and be like, "I don't know anything, and I'm gonna I'm gonna resist the process the whole way. There will be parts of me that are gonna fight this as much as I want to feel better and feel good and feel amazing. All of my habits and patterns and everything is gonna fight it along the way, but I'm gonna trust. I'm gonna have patience. It's gonna be a process, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going and trying to unhook from what our mind is telling us it needs to be like this, or it's got to look like that, or why are they doing this, or the tassel is on the right side of the head as opposed to the left side of the head, and why is why is this maestro wearing her hat and this one isn't? And it's, it's on and on the kind of the thoughts that we get woven into, or the thoughts that come up that that we create in our mind just to hijack our experience. So when we show up with a level of patience, a level of humility and openness to learn, then I think that helps to garner a bit of respect. I love your answer because <laughs> I think for people listening who maybe haven't sat with ayahuasca, maybe like fully aren't on the path, there's a lot of people who listen to this podcast that are very curious. And there's a lot of talk about things like ayahuasca and mushrooms being tools, right? It's a tool for me to get this outcome that I'm looking for. It's a tool for me to release all my trauma and just completely change my life in a week. It's a tool. It's a tool. The deeper that I get on this path, I see it as less of a tool and more of a path as a way of living, as a way of being, as a way of choosing to walk this life. And there is a level of openness, which Julian talked about, and a level of surrendering control 
and giving up knowing that Karina talked about that is involved in this. I don't know. I'd be curious to hear what you guys think, but I think that is the way of the medicine. Can you choose it as a path? Can you walk with it without expectation? Can you come and learn from it? Not knowing what you're going to learn. That's what this is all about for me. Sure. When I first started, I was like broken and tormented and looking for something to get me out of my misery, but that's not what it's all about. It's like about living open to learning, not knowing where that's going to take you. Beautiful. That's a beautiful insight. I think with the accessibility of some of these medicines that more and more people that aren't necessarily drawn to it are they're being exposed to it. So they are curious. And I think that many Westerners might see it as a tool, but I go back to it's a relationship. And I also like the fact that you said the word surrender, because it's really not achieving, right? We're not achieving this healing. We really need to surrender to what it is that we need to see or let go of before we can make space to enter into a new type of relationship with ourselves. So the plants being these wise, incredible allies that are here to help us on our journey, it's really about being in relationship with them. I always like to tell people when they come into the temple, just pretend like you're about to meet your newest beloved. Like, how do you want to show up for that new relationship? How do you want to walk that new relationship? It's certainly not in a way of, I want to use this as a tool to make myself better because then where, again, where's the give and take, where's the reciprocity? So yeah, for me, it goes back to relationship. And thank you for bringing that up because I think it's a really beautiful insight. Yeah, good. I'm yeah, glad. It's, I'm glad. It's, yeah, it's just such a beautiful path to be on and to meet people like you both who are so deep on the path as well. Sorry, go ahead, Julian. <laughs> yeah, I. It's. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. I, I think we can look to we can look to the teachers. The teachers being the medicine, as allies, as teachers, as wisdom keepers themselves. If we just think about we just think about the intelligence of a mushroom. These mushrooms, not only the psychoactive ones, but all the other medicinal mushrooms, they will inherit the earth. They are anti fragile. We are here and we have everything around us because of that intelligence. So if we want to learn resiliency in ourselves, if we want to learn anti fragility then we need to go to this or this organism, this fungus, this intelligence to learn from it. And a couple of things that you mentioned, one of the things is that you mentioned the word unlearning, and that's a great way of putting it. It's this idea that we might learn some things and we might unlearn some things. And, and that could be a, that could be a good thing. And, and I think as we work with this path, they certainly become teachers and they certainly become allies. And, and then the relationship of who's really the tool in the relationship becomes very clear uh, as, as we consistently work with the work with the medicines. So yeah, everything that we shared about the wisdom keepers is, is the same for the medicine. It's the same for the medicine themselves. And this is what we've learned by sitting with these teachers is that they look to the plants. They look to the fungus. They say, I learned to play the guitar because the plants told me. And, I'm, I, and I can only sing because of the plants. And the plants keep teaching me. And the, and the mushrooms this and the cactus this. And so they're in relationship as students, as they are teachers. So it's this very beautiful symbiosis that's created within the space. So not only are many of the wisdom keepers or wisdom sharers are here to work in the space and guide and, and do some healings, but they are also there as students themselves. So it, it allows for a sense of, of walking side by side with someone in something. Yeah. yeah. So beautiful. And I'm being reminded of your team and the maestras were, I know it's not traditional to have instruments in the Shipibo ceremonies, but because of your relationship with them, they allowed a few songs to be shared after the closing of the ceremony by Mariana and Dylan and Jessica and Carrie. And oh my God, that's so beautiful. I have no doubt that they probably, <laughs> I can see such like a fully integrated life when they were sharing their songs it felt so inspired by the medicine inspired by the medicine and taught by the medicine to share those songs because it felt like the spirit of the medicine to me so beautiful yeah and in in those ceremonies those maestras those specific maestras really like that music 
So it's really nice for them Aww. after they've sung to everyone because we know in the ceremony they come yeah. in front of every person wow. and deliver an ikaro. And there we had three maestras there delivering an ikaro per person. And so it's nice for them to come sit back and then they like to listen to a little bit of the guitar music. So we like to make them happy. Yeah. Can we just talk for a moment about the energy in that room and how, wow, <laughs> I had quite a bit of experience with ayahuasca before that, and I felt like that was the first time I met the medicine because of working with that direct lineage. Have you, either of you had experience like working not with a direct lineage and direct lineage and like the difference between them? Yeah, I've worked with CISO folks that are serving medicine and even some Western folks that are serving medicine. Uh, and of course, the direct lineages with the indigenous wisdom keepers. And it really depends on where you are on your journey and how you connect with the medicine. The Shipibo Maestras are my teachers because their wave has really resonated for me. For me, it's like they're like the surgeons of the medical team within the ayahuasca space. So their ikaros are incredibly potent. And these Ikaros are not just songs, right? They're healing songs that they learn from the plants after dieting, like really intense master plant diets, very long periods of time in silence, very rigorous work. And so they have done so much of this work so that they can come and sit in front of us and deliver these healing songs. It's one of the biggest blessings of my life. So for me, understanding the tests and the rigor and the diets and all of the things that come with the indigenous ways, obviously each nation, each culture having their own way of doing things, it makes a huge difference to me when it comes time to sit with someone and to receive healing and direct transmission and such. It, makes a, it does make a big difference for me. And is it true that Maestra Inas was sent into the jungle age 13 for a year? On her own? She was very young when she started her, her diets. Yeah, she's just a powerhouse. And it's very rare to see someone of her eldership still coming and leaving their village and coming and wanting to share. She's very passionate about sharing the work and she loves working with her daughters. So it's an absolute blessing and honor for us to be able to create a space where she can come and feel comfortable. So special. So special. Okay, stewardship. So... I'm going to talk a little bit about the property at Reunion and your relationship with the land. And this. can you tell us a little bit about how you guys are like relating to the land and stewarding it? Because that was one of the cleanest beaches I've seen in Costa Rica. The energy of the space felt so clean, so clear, so loved and so taken care of. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Maybe how like the medicine is guiding the relationship with the land? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. And to go into something that you mentioned before, and this goes into this question, is you mentioned uh, the power, the potency, the energy in the temple. And that speaks to all of the layers here. So it speaks to the ethos behind the not-for-profit and then the entire team behind the medicine carriers and the facilitators, as far as the all of the staff here, all of the contributors here, they allow us to do our work. And then coming, coming in as a facilitation team, the level of dedication and focus that the, the team has here is it, it, really amazing and it generates that energy. So then when the maestros or the maestros come into a space, they can really be held and supported by this whole collective energy, which is which goes all the way back into maybe thought form. We're getting a little out there, so I'll reel that back in. So when it comes to when it comes to the land here, one of the one of the basic things that we have is we have a pole with buckets on it. And this invites people to go for a walk on the beach and pick up plastic or anything else they find on the beach. We find all sorts of things. So it, it's a collective effort and it's important. So that's one way of praying. And then as we go more perhaps energetic or spiritual, we then make offerings to the land. We bring flowers to the ocean on a regular basis. We do what are called despacho ceremonies. We have land blessings. So all of that contributes energetics to everything else that goes on. And then of course there is, there's a ground crew team and they're here and they're planting and they're tending to the plants and, and the trees and the bushes, et cetera. And they're always smiling. <laughs> they seem really happy. 
Yeah. And it's something that, again, it's a process. We're still learning. We're still learning how to be in, in a really great relationship with this land. It's, it's, it starts with that perspective. How can we be in relationship as opposed to maybe how can we be in domination too? And that's what we're trying to do. And we do believe our prayers and the prayers of the teachers and the prayers of the plants and the medicine and our focus and our thoughts and the beach cleanup practices has an impact on that. Yeah, I think like the spirit of the wind is strong at reunion because you're just constantly caressed by that ocean breeze. I've never been in an environment like that for an entire week. What role do you think that like the ocean and that ocean breeze plays with the medicine work going in and swimming the morning after ceremony, not during ceremony. Okay. It didn't break any rules, <laughs> but after ceremony and just like being able to cleanse the body with the ocean water and to sleep in the temple, which I don't understand why I was the only person doing that, but <laughs> to sleep in the temple with the wind and like the waves all night. Oh my God. Magic. Magic. I think that reunion is like the highest What's the word I'm looking for? Like the highest expression of that land. It's like, this is what that land was made for. Yeah, we're in devotion to the elements here. Earth, water, fire, air. So having the ocean be right there, a great master teacher, this ebb and flow, this reminder every day is incredibly potent. And of course, it's so good for cleansing, being able to jump in the next day after ceremony and just cleansing the body, cleansing the energy. We often say that the ocean here is another one of our space holders that, you know, because when you're in the temple, you can hear the ocean in the background and you're entering into this medicine space. And sometimes it can be quite intense yeah. and the ocean is there to hold us in that way. It's a complete blessing. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely felt that the land was holding me through all of that. I tend Maya's workshop. I created a little poem about that feeling of learning from the land and being held by the land. And I can see why your entire team who lives there is just so creative <laughs> and like always wanting to express themselves. Like it, that space makes it easy <laughs> to connect with that inner creation. One of the things I really appreciated about the space holding, about the facilitators, is how narrative neutral the space was. There was no point where I felt like a particular spiritual truth or narrative was like being shoved down our throats. I really appreciated how it was just like about the medicine. Yes, there was some like Buddhist teachings thrown in there when it came to like food. And being intentional with that, but it wasn't overwhelming. Can you guys talk a little bit about kind of the importance of creating, a, yeah, I call it narrative neutral medicine spaces and like creating a space where people are free to explore what spirituality and connection to something greater means for them? Yes, I love that term narrative neutral. It starts for us by the understanding that we are working with a lot of different lineages and a lot of different cultures. So we have the utmost respect for all of those spiritual practices. And our team, they are incredible, but we are not here to heal people and we are not here to tell people what to do. We're here to support them. We have some experience. We're here to share about our experience. And sometimes the best thing to do as a facilitator is to get out of the way and to allow the medicine and the participant to develop and create their relationship the way it needs to be developed without suggestions, without implementing any types of rules or dogmatic approaches to things. So for us, it's really about creating a space of someone that wants to come in and learn from themselves as well. It's like we all carry this beautiful wisdom inside and the medicine has a way of helping us to access that wisdom. So it's really about you are your own healer and we're here to hold you so that you can connect to that inner wisdom that wants to be expressed. Yeah, many paths to the mountaintop sort of thing. And we try and focus on the process on on and on the process of healing and awakening that wisdom from within and developing one's own realizations and as karina mentioned just, we really just try and get out of the way and that being said provide like a healthy boundary for people really to stay focused we all carry our different shapes and forms and relationships with spirituality and what that means to us and everyone that comes through 
has some form of relationship with spirituality or religion or the mystery or the void or whatever it might be. And the, this is a space for us to see how these things make sense in our lives. And we see people coming through here. We see Buddhists and former Buddhists come through. We see Christians and former Christians come through. We see many different traditions, people coming through that are in a new relationship with themselves and with their own sense of spirituality. So although we might drop in different teachings or different wisdoms from lineages that we've learned, it's really about creating a space so anyone that comes can start to develop a connection with something greater on their own terms whether that something greater is a specific deity or is our different deities or it's a sense of an elemental connection or it's a it's a quantum understanding of the universe whatever it might be and part of the healing is there too is that we want to create a space so we can foster that learning from within and to go back to one something that we talked about way back with some of the learnings and some of the unlearnings from these teachers from the wisdom carriers and from the plants is that sometimes they're inexact teachings or they're not direct it's how do you play this instrument and the teaching is ask the instrument when you're wait what there's no like scales like i don't play chords or anything and so this is is it's like what's your relationship with spirituality it's, i'm not gonna what does it mean to you things so there's a level of figuring it out and that's that kind of gets us into this idea around a shamanic mind or around an animistic worldview which which opens up a deeper possibility to connection with self and spirit and, and goddess etc so yeah. yeah and i think that only those who have reached a level of like egolessness and detachment from having it all figured out within the spiritual realm, which like, how can we ever even <laughs> have it all figured out? Like it, it takes reaching that level within one's own spiritual path to create a space and container that isn't enforcing certain spiritual principles upon others. So yeah, I just want to give you guys a shout out to that because that was one of the things I was like really impressed with. Because again, I've been in medicine spaces where it was like very new age and like very like conspiracy theory and all that stuff. And it you just don't need it. It complicates things. I want to start winding this down for people who are listening and want to come visit reunion, but they're not sure between inner alchemy, psilocybin experience or wisdom keepers, ayahuasca experience, what guidance would you give people? I think firstly, I would say to schedule a discovery call. Like I think it makes a lot of sense, regardless of where you're looking to join a retreat. I think it's good to be able to talk to someone directly on the team there and ask questions. Just ask where the medicine's from, ask how much experience the people have at the center. Some of these more basic questions that will help you to start feeling at ease with committing. And then once you can start to feel a little bit more at ease, you can start to maybe do some journaling, do some meditating on your own, really just start to feel into which is the medicine that is calling to me right now and why. And again, you can have that dialogue with someone on our team here at Reunion and we can just help. We're never going to tell you which one <laughs> you should sign up for, but we can help share from our experiences and give some recommendations. And it's not true that people should have worked with psilocybin before ayahuasca. There's not a hierarchy here. No, no hierarchy. Some people come, it's their first time, it's ayahuasca, and then they come back for psilocybin and some people vice versa. It, it's something that that you can that you can do an intuitive practice where if you're not sure, you can wake up in the morning and with a question, mushrooms or ayahuasca? And what's the first thing that comes to mind? And then do that over the course of a week or a couple of weeks and see what you're stacking into. And this is where the medicine starts to come in where these medicines work outside of linear time. So you'll get actual messages. Like you might start seeing mushrooms everywhere or it'll start popping up everywhere or you'll meet people that have been to Peru or Colombia that have worked with ayahuasca. So it's something where it's let the medicine come to you sort of thing. And once that decision is made, once that choice is made in your mind, in your heart, then it's really time to get quiet. 
it's really time to just start establishing that relationship. And we will send you suggestions, strong suggestions on things to do and not to do before you come. We highly recommend that you do that. You'll get more out of the experience if you do. So yeah, the relationship is established. In many ways, it'll come to you. You'll have a hit. Like you'll just know like this is what feels right. Yeah. So. Cool. And then you have some other new and exciting offerings coming up outside of the signature programs. Can you share with us what those are and when they're happening? Yes, thanks for asking. So we are in the process of creating a facilitator training program. So we'll share more details once that's all ready to go. We hope to launch that in the fall. We're really excited about this because we understand the landscape that's out right now, as, as I mentioned, accessibility and some places even legalization or decriminalization. There are more and more people that really want to be part of the medicine, which is wonderful. And I think that we have so much to share. We have this beautiful center and we also have these relationships with the wisdom keepers. So within the facilitation training program, we will be highlighting the wisdom keepers as their own module, as they can share on relating to the medicine and the ceremonial context. And so that is in the works and we're really excited about that. We're also creating some specialty weeks. We'll have a women's week coming up in March, which details will be up on the website soon. We also have a really incredible LGBTQR container that's being created specifically for folks in that community. And so some of the information is already up on the website and some should be up there really soon. So we're starting to listen to what it is that people are looking for. And we're also creating this overarching understanding of the culture of care. What is it that means for us? And that to us means listening. What do people need outside of maybe these two experiences, the reunion ayahuasca wisdom keeper experience and the inner alchemy psilocybin experience? Perhaps it's a closed container for a specific community, these types of things. So within that culture of care, it's like we're listening to what folks need and folks want. We're also going to be building out a longer integration program, community calls. We have our first one scheduled, I think, in August, where we're basically going to open it up to anyone that's been through reunion. So typically when you come, you get an integration call after your journey, about four weeks after the journey with your cohort. And now we're starting the culture of care community calls, which means anyone that's been to reunion can be part of that call and feel supported, feel reconnected to the folks that were there during their week, but also to people that came in that experienced the medicine and as well as our facilitation team will be part of it. So we're really excited to be able to offer that type of care that we're learning more and more about as we explore the medicine space together with the wisdom keepers and the medicine and the land. It's all unfolding. Beautiful offerings. And I love the commitment to learning and listening and adapting with what is wanted and needed. And that facilitator training sounds amazing. I can't wait to hear about that. I would definitely trust going through a program like that with your team. Can you tell I just have like <laughs> questions on all of you? <laughs> I love you all so much. Thank you. <laughs> so you much came to, to learn. visit us and be with us. It was oh. such a pleasure to have you. And it's such a pleasure to be on here chatting like this. Really amazing questions. And yeah, really excited to deepen our relationship yeah. in this way. So thank you. Yeah, I think we're in for a beautiful, long, collaborative partnership of supporting each other. And I'm so honored to have met you guys. Shout out to Tim for reaching out and connecting me. You guys are like the first, one of the first retreat centers I've had on the show. So that just speaks volumes. <laughs> I wouldn't be sharing this with people if I didn't truly trust and believe in you guys. So thank you so much for just doing the work that you're doing and doing it with so much humility, openness, and studentship. Studentship? <laughs> Being willing to be a student. Any parting words of wisdom that you want to share with people before I let you guys get back to your day? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> two quick things before before we get to the words of wisdom. Two things in total. But just so it's clear, we're speaking from our experiences and we're not speaking on behalf of any specific lineage. We're not speaking, we're not putting words in anybody's mouth. We're speaking from our direct experience. Just so that's just that's there's so there's no confusion there. And yeah, when it comes to words of wisdom, do 
bring joy into your life somehow. Do something weird, do something silly, play. Uh, yeah, it might not be shamanic or plant medicine or whatever, but bring some joy into your life and, and see what kind of medicine that, that brings. Yeah, that's all. Thank you for having us. It's been a, I love it's that. Been a, it's been a pleasure. And then we'll let Karina say the last. Yeah, just again, thank you for everything. And Julian acknowledged the contributors here. We really couldn't do everything that we're doing without the incredible team that we have here, from the grounds crew to the amazing kitchen, to the front desk, to the folks in our office. We're just grateful, really grateful to have the opportunity to even be working with the medicines and to help people step into their own healing journeys. And yeah, I think that for me, something really important that has come from the medicine is the understanding that we are always learning. And even through those more challenging situations, there there is a lot of good learning and a lot of wisdom that comes from some of those challenging moments. So changing the lens, changing perspective to think, okay, this is a learning moment. It may be challenging, but it's also a learning moment. How do I step into this with a beginner's mind? And how do I open to the wisdom that needs to be shared with me right now, bringing in a lot of joy, as Julian mentioned. And I think that balance has been really helpful for me in my life. So just if it's challenging, it's a learning situation and the reminder to bring in joy. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. So I'll leave a link for people to schedule a discovery call if they're intrigued. There's a code modern reunion that people can use, which will contribute to a scholarship fund between Reunion and Modern Psychedelics to send someone from my community there. And then where else can people find you or get in touch? Yeah, I think there's we have an Instagram, Reunion Experience on Instagram, and also our emails, which we Which can, is so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mariana does a She's beautiful job. She's incredible. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and our emails, which I think you can probably share in the notes, but that's the best way to find us. I'll do that. All Thank right, you. guys, everything will be linked in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening, everyone. I hope that you could just feel all the love. <laughs> I've had goosebumps throughout this whole conversation. And we'll catch you guys next time. Hope Bye. to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to and supporting the show. To stay in touch, sign up for my mailing list, which can be found in the show notes or on modernpsychedelics.net. If this episode sparked something within, please let me know by leaving a review of the Modern Psychedelics podcast on Apple and Spotify. This really helps to share these messages with those who need them, which is the whole reason why I do what I do. And if you haven't already, come join the ongoing conversation over on Instagram with other beautiful souls. We have an incredible and conscious community over at the handle Modern Psychedelics. And don't forget that the work begins after you come back down to earth. And I'm standing shoulder to shoulder doing it with you.